you're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a murderer turned best-selling crime author. Now, when the least suspected person becomes a killer, a town is left baffled and horrified. Yet this wasn't the worst part. The killer would vanish into thin air and become someone that was idolized by many. No one knew who they truly were or about their past until the truth finally came out and shocked them all. I also want to thank Care Of for sponsoring this portion of the video. These little vitamin packets have seriously been so helpful lately. Care Of makes it so easy to get your daily vitamins and all you have to do is grab these adorable little packets that have little messages on the front of them, little daily prompts, and they're also eco-friendly packaging. But what is more important is what is actually inside these packets, which are the vitamins that you are given off of a five minute quiz and this really will get deep into what your body and your mind needs and is lacking and it's a wonderful way to make sure that you are taking care of your body then once you approve these supplements you want they're sent straight to your door you don't have to think about it again so if you would like to take the quiz to see what Kara recommends for you just click the link below and you can also get 50% off your first order with the code Brooke M that's 50% off your first order with the code Brooke M and and thank you to Kara for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1954 in New Zealand, and Honora Reaper was a 45-year-old woman who lived in Christchurch with her three children who were Wendy, Pauline, and Rosemary. Now she also had a fourth child that was the firstborn that unfortunately passed shortly after birth due to a heart malfunction. Now, she also had a partner named Herbert, who was the father of all of these children, and he also managed a fishing business. So, they didn't have a ton of money, and they definitely weren't the most known family around town, but they did have a home that was big enough to do boarding, where they could bring in other people to make a little bit more money. Nora was out on a walk on June 22nd. She had gone to the Victoria Park and she went to one of the tea little kiosk areas where she could have tea and a little snack. She wasn't alone when she went here. She actually went with her middle child Pauline as well as Pauline's friend named Juliet. They were 16 and 15 and they wanted to go on this walk with Honora. So they were more than happy on this very nice day to have some time together. But that day didn't turn out to be as relaxing as Honora hoped because it was a day that ended in murder. You see, that afternoon, Pauline and Juliet had gone out with their mother, or gone out with Pauline's mother, to go on a walk after going to these tea rooms to eat. And then suddenly, they were running back to the tea rooms to get help. This is when they found the owners of these little t kiosk areas, and this was Agnes and Kenneth Ritchie. And they went up to them, they were screaming, they were crying, and they were covered in blood. These girls looked distraught and Agnes immediately asked if they were okay, and that's when she quickly realized that it wasn't them who was hurt. They were saying that Honora was hurt and bad. These girls were saying she had fallen on a rock and hit her head and was bleeding profusely. And now they said that her head kept banging onto this rock and they tried to help her, but they couldn't and they feared that they had only made it worse. Juliet really refused to talk further about what had happened and they both wanted to wash their hands and their clothes of the blood. When the police arrived, they asked the girls to point down which path in this park led to Honora and they refused because they didn't want to see her body again, but Pauline did end up going to the start of the path they had taken to point them down that direction. They pleaded not to go back and so thinking that these girls were distraught, they had just seen a mother figure possibly dying, they didn't want to traumatize them further and so they said they could stay there with Agnes and Kenneth Ritchie while the investigators went to 
see what this scene really was. But in the back of their minds, investigators kept in mind that these girls were covered in blood and their faces were also splattered. They had a sneaking suspicion, but they didn't even know if there was a victim yet. But 130 meters down in the woods near a bridge, they did find a body. However, her injuries showed that Honora didn't just slip and fall on a rock. Her head was bashed in. There was no rocks around her and her head was actually caved in with a pool of blood around her. It also appeared as though she had been trying to defend herself because there were defense wounds on her hands as well as a broken pinky. She had been bludgeoned to death. This had been a murder and investigators feared that these two young innocent looking girls covered in blood knew a lot more than they were letting on. Pauline was said to be very calm throughout the entire thing. She was the one that did most of the talking, but it wasn't like she was very distraught when she spoke about it. Juliet didn't really say much, and both of the girls had asked Agnes if they could clean up. So Agnes had taken them inside to basically give them new clothes, to wash their clothes, and to let them have a bath to clean off the blood. Now the owner, Agnes, said that something that she realized was very strange was that these girls were giggling about how nice she was and that she was doing this for them. Agnes and Kenneth talked about it and realized that they needed to tell investigators what they found that was so odd about these girls and what they feared they had done. However, they were picked up by Juliet's father, Henry, before investigators could talk to them. Now, Henry was actually the director of a nearby university. He was highly respected, he was wealthy, and he had actually been one of the men to help create the first atomic bomb. So he was well known and he came and picked up the girls because Agnes and Kenneth had called their parents and Henry had come to pick them up. Now at this time, Herbert, who was Pauline's father and Nora's husband, was brought to the crime scene of his deceased wife and he was asked a question that no father could have imagined he would be being asked. He was asked by investigators if they could question his daughter and the murder of her mother. He said nothing, but he nodded slowly, giving them permission and probably trying to figure out what in the world was happening. Now, eventually, Pauline was questioned, and this is when things began to unravel. You see, both Honora and Pauline went by the last name of Reaper at this time. However, when you look into this case, the last name of Parker is used for both of them. And that is because when it was looked into, it was found that Herbert was never really married to Honora, meaning her last name was still Parker and her kids' names were Parker as well. Now, Herbert was actually married to another woman whom he had two children with several years prior to knowing Honora. However, he had met Honora at work one day and they started an affair and eventually moved together and left his ex with the two children, never for them to see him again. And Honora and Herbert then started their own family, but they could never officially get married because he was already legally married. He did, however, almost go to jail because he wasn't paying child support. However, eventually he paid and he was released. But from this point on in the case, Honora and Pauline were going by the last name of Parker because it's who they were legally. Meanwhile, at the crime scene, the murder weapon was found nearby. It was actually in some bushes only a few feet away from her body. This was actually a bloodied brick inside stockings, like women's stockings that they would wear under skirts. While they tried to figure out who in the world would use a brick in stockings to kill a innocent mother, they also began questioning Juliet, the other girl. Pauline's friend. Now, Juliette Hume was from a very wealthy family. She was not originally from Christchurch, the area like the Parkers were. She had traveled a lot when she was younger. She was actually living in the UK for a while with her family, and she was actually born the first child to Henry and 
Hilda. She didn't spend a ton of time with her family, which we will get into in a little while, but she was often traveling and living with family and friends all across the world, but they did eventually come together in Christchurch when Henry got a job as this director of the university. And so they were finally back together. They were extremely wealthy living in this big home, and this was nothing like Pauline's family at all. They were completely different, yet these two girls had met at Christchurch Girls High high school and they hit it off immediately. They actually bonded over the fact that they had both had illnesses when they were children. Pauline had suffered from osteomyelitis, which was basically a bone infection, and this left her having to stay in the hospital for like eight months, and she had multiple surgeries, and she still had a limp afterwards for years, and I think at this point she did as well. Whereas Juliet suffered from tuberculosis or the infectious disease that infects the lungs. And she would often have to go to the hospital to get help. She was told to go live in warmer climates. And so she was often moving around, like I said. But beyond that, they also both loved books and were very smart girls and were very much in their heads most of the time. So did these two young, innocent-looking girls just become killers? And if so, why? The media and the city of Christchurch were all over this case. This is not an area that was well known to have violent crimes at all. Everyone knew who the prime suspects were, but they were confused at how this could have happened. Now, this news was spreading like wildfire. Many began to say that these girls had actually done this because they were lesbians and others said that they were insane. And many believe during this time that those two words, lesbian and insane, were one and the same. And that the fact that they loved the same gender meant that they were out of their minds. This was 1954 and the way people thought was disturbing. But Juliet's father, Henry, was sticking up for Juliet, saying that he had talked to her and she said that she hadn't been there when Honora fell. That she was actually looking at this little tiny pink stone and that she heard someone scream and she went running. She said that's when she found Honora on the ground. He also said that Juliet was in a calm, very good mood the morning before they left for this park. But these girls weren't brought down to the police station to be questioned. This is 1954 and they were questioned in Juliet's bedroom where they had been taken back to the home by Henry. And Pauline told the story to investigators. This was the same exact story she had told the tea owners at the kiosk that had happened about her mother falling. And investigators did have a few questions to ask her, thankfully, because they wanted to know how she knew her mother was dead because she had gone up to Agnes and Kenneth saying that her mother was already deceased and she immediately said that there was so much blood that she just figured she was already dead because of the amount of blood that was outside of her body. Pauline was then asked if she knew why there were stockings nearby the crime scene and she said that she didn't wear stockings. But then a little while later, she was saying she did have some stockings in her purse that she just kept as like, you know, in case of an emergency. And she also used those to wipe up some of her mother's blood. Paula admitted that Juliet was there with her, further making her story seem like a lie. Pauline wasn't admitting to anything like they expected a daughter who just murdered her mother to do. She was able to really keep it together and to not seem too suspicious if it wasn't for the very odd time period and what had occurred right after the murder. They wouldn't have suspected this young girl. Now, that is when they decided to go to Juliet to see if they could get anything out of her. They only needed her to confess that her friend was involved with this and had committed a murder and this wasn't an accident. They told her that they did not suspect her at all, but they needed her to stop covering up for Pauline. This is when the 15-year-old told investigators that she had been quite a while 
behind Honora and Pauline the entire time on their walk and that is when she found this pink stone. It was really small and it was beautiful and she thought it came from a ring so she started looking around for the rest of the ring and that is when she heard shouting happening ahead. Now she said that by the time that she made it to the mother and daughter, Honora was already on the ground bleeding. Juliet said that she saw no brick, no stockings, and that she told everyone that she was with Pauline the whole time because she thought it was just an argument between mother and daughter that had gone horribly wrong and that Enora really had just fallen down. Upon hearing this confession, investigators went back to Pauline telling her that Juliet had confessed to the truth and told them everything. And so Pauline kind of switched at this point. She heard that she was on her own, that her best friend had just given her up, and she was also being charged with murder. And then she started to talk. At this point, in a very emotionless tone, she admitted that she had taken the brick and the stocking in her purse that day, and she hit her mother over the head several times. When asked how many times, she claimed, I don't know, a great many times, I should imagine. Pauline was then said to be left in her cell, and she was writing on a piece of paper that she was given, and Eventually, this investigator found this note and was reading it, and it was almost like Pauline was writing a diary entry. She was writing about that day, saying that the murder, or she spelled it moiter, which is apparently how movies back then, like crime movies, would talk about murder. They were like in gangs, and they would say moiter, and that's how it sounded, so she wrote moiter, and that the moiter had occurred successfully. She then said she was taking the blame for it all. After seeing this, suddenly the innocent looking Juliet who had just happened upon this murder and didn't see a thing, wasn't looking as innocent. The investigators began to think that Pauline was just taking all of the blame and letting Juliet go free. So with them not wanting this to happen, the Parker's home was searched to see if they could find any further evidence that these two girls did this murder together or had planned it together or anything that pointed to premeditation. And that is when a whole diary was found of Pauline's. There was many entries about the murder or the moiter and this was saying that Pauline and Juliet plan to commit it. This is exactly what they were looking for. It was all written in this diary. Investigators flipped to the day before the murder, which was June 21st, and disturbingly enough, Pauline had written that she had talked to Juliet on the phone and they had come up with a murder weapon. She said, we decided to use a rock and a stocking rather than a sandbag. We discussed the moiter and I felt keyed up as if I were planning a surprise party. On the day of the murder, only one sentence was written down. It looked like somebody had written it as like a header and they hadn't filled out that entry because that day hadn't happened yet. But the header said, the day of the happy event. So while investigators were realizing that this was a team effort, they didn't know just how much of a relationship these two girls had. And that was the fact that these girls would write poetry together, they would write books, they would write plays, and they had this fantasy life that they would act out in reality and they never really switched back from reality to their fantasy life. They were always in their own world, which is completely normal and okay for children, for even teens, but it became so real to them that they decided to actually change their names and only go by these names to each other. Pauline became Gina, Juliet became Deborah, and they would only refer to each other as Gina and Deborah. This wasn't the strangest part though. They actually created their own religion and they would worship saints based on celebrities. Now, they lived in what they called the fourth world, which was a parallel dimension which they believed to be superior to heaven and that only a few people could get into. And the reason they could get into it was because they were friends with each other. They believed that their friendship made them have this higher power. They believed this was a place they could go for spiritual enlightenment and they also believed they were apart from the law. They weren't better than the law, they were just 
you know, not, not in the same realm as people who had to abide by the laws. Sometimes they would also assume the identities of two men who were Charles and Lance, and they would write each other about these adventures that they would go on that would often lead to murder, suicide, rape, and revenge. This level of attachment between these two girls appeared to be much more than friendship, but it was more of an obsession with each other, a toxic relationship with this world that they had created around them that they didn't let anybody else in and they refuse to come out of. We often talk about friends or lovers who were inseparable, but this was more than that. It was to a level that nobody knew how to handle. They were codependent on one another and they would get upset if they couldn't see each other for more than a day. They felt lost, they felt down, they felt like they couldn't survive without the other. In fact, Pauline was talked to while she was in jail about the note that the investigator had found saying that she was gonna take the blame for all of it. And the investigator asked her, does this mean that Juliet was a part of this murder and you're just taking the blame? And Pauline didn't really answer, but she did say that she wanted to be put in a room with Juliet so she could talk to her because Juliet would say anything that Pauline told her to say. The investigator was baffled that this 16 year old girl thought that she was going to be put into a room with the possible other killer of her mother. And she was told no. And the officer actually left the room and Pauline was left in arm's reach of this letter that, or this note that she had wrote that the investigator had confiscated saying that she was taking the blame for it all. This was evidence in the case. However, Pauline suddenly picked it up and threw it into a fire. Thankfully, there was somebody else in the room who got it out of the fire, saved it, and it could be collected as further evidence, but it was just a very strange thing that she wouldn't want that to be seen. Now, Juliet was then arrested and put in a cell or a nearby cell to Pauline. I think it's very strange that they didn't want them in the same room talking, but yet they put them either nearby or in the same exact cell. However, I did read somewhere that there were only two cells for women during this time in Christchurch, and so there was not a lot of options on where to put them, but this gave them exactly what they wanted and they were able to speak. But both girls were charged with murder and their trial was set. However, neither of them had ever said why they had done this. They had no idea what the possible motive was. However, Juliet would soon be the one to talk, just as she did before. But she said that the pink rock she originally found was actually her own, that she had brought it there from a brooch that she had broken it off of. And the plan was for her to drop it on the path for Honora to be brought over to look at it, to bend over, and then Pauline would hit her over the head. So it looked like she had just fallen down. She said that Honora did just this, but she was screaming. She was holding her hands over her head and she was also trying to get up. So Juliet had to try to push her down while Pauline was hitting her over the head with a brick. That's when Juliet picked up the brick and started hitting her as well. And she then held her down by her throat while Pauline finished the job and killed her own mother. They said that they wanted to roll her into the ravine, but they realized she was too heavy, and so they went screaming for help, all bloody, because it was a part of their plan. And they said they also discussed that since they were minors, that it was okay if they were caught, because they wouldn't get the death penalty, and they also would be together, which is where they wanted to be. You see, Pauline and Juliet's parents were not happy with the world that the girls had created for themselves and how they spent so much time together because at first they were going on vacations together. They were staying the night at each other's houses all the time, but Juliet's parents would notice that every time Pauline left, Juliet became almost another person. She seemed ill. She seemed withdrawn. She was not herself until Pauline came back. Pauline's parents had another concern though. They believed that Juliet and Pauline had a sexual relationship and this was of course forbidden during this time and was actually believed to be a mental illness. But they actually went to a doctor for help on this and the doctor said that he was certain that these two girls 
were sexual with one another. So both of them hearing all of this, seeing the world that these two girls were in and just not approving of how much they cared for one another, they were determined to separate them. And this plan began happening sooner than the girls realized. You see, they began refusing to let them spend the night at each other's houses and then Juliet's parents got a divorce. And this was basically the beginning of the end because her father began planning to move once again. And he was going to move out of the country, but Juliet was going to be sent to South Africa to stay with some friends. And she was not allowed to stay in Christchurch. But it turned out the girls refused to let this separation happen. And they hatched a plan to have Pauline go with her to South Africa and everything seemed okay again. Both of the girls were pretty much out of school at this point, so they figured they could just finish it up there. And then they wanted to move on to the United States where they could either go to Hollywood or New York City and they could basically turn their writing into published novels and movies and they were basically going to accomplish their dreams together. The only problem was, you guessed it, and Nora Parker didn't want this to happen and told Pauline she couldn't go. Pauline's diary spoke of times before, way before the murder, that she had spoken to Juliet and Juliet didn't disagree violently and that that meant she was okay with it and that they were thrilled by the idea and she naturally felt a trifle of nervousness but also a pleasure of anticipation for killing her mother. But Juliet finally confessed to something else and that was the fact that she was the one to actually provide Pauline with the murder weapon that day. She had gotten a brick and a stocking and she said that after the first hit of Honora, she knew that they would have to kill her. With both confessions saying that these girls were equally as responsible in the murder, the trials should have been an easy guilty verdict. However, they would plead guilty by reason of insanity from their lawyers. Now their lawyers brought in a psychiatrist who said that they were delusional due to homosexuality that they suffered fully ado or madness of two, which was a shared psychosis that caused them to commit murder. Both showed no signs of remorse during this trial at all. And Juliet even said she believed that Honora knew what they were going to do beforehand and didn't make them feel guilty about it at all. So that's why she felt better about doing it. Juliet said she was an unhappy woman anyways, like that made it any better. The prosecution also agreed saying that they were dirty-minded girls. Now the media of course were running this story and they had headlines about the fact that they were lesbians, about the fact that they were two girls who possibly loved each other, who possibly had a sexual relationship. People who knew the girls, who said that they actually weren't the nicest people at all. Juliet's housekeeper said she was rude, arrogant, and disrespectful. And it was known that Pauline would rage anytime she didn't get her way. Neither girls respected authority, adults, and they refused to do what they were told. However, it was also found that Juliet had experienced a large amount of trauma when she was a very young girl that can cause mental illness. It can cause lots of problems in the future. But she had been put through several bombings where she lived with her family. And one time she was actually unable to make it to the shelter because her mother had gone first and left her behind and she couldn't make it in. And so she had to lay in the snow while bombs hit around her. After this, she of course was suffering from severe PTSD, which at that time they called bomb shock. And this caused her to have severe nightmares for years afterwards. From this experience of her having to literally lay in the snow for hours, she also suffered from diseases after this. And she was sent to warmer climates to help her with this. And so from a young age, she was separated from her family quite a lot for months at a time, for years at a time with them not contacting her at all. And most of the people she was with, she barely knew. This can cause extreme 
attachment issues that can forever affect one's life and mental stability, especially at this young of an age. And when she did see her family, she despised her younger brother because he got to stay with the family all the time. He was never sent away, even though she had been. I didn't find much about Pauline's trauma or anything she experienced when she was younger. She was kind of a loner and she at times didn't get along with her mother, but other than that, it seemed like she had a pretty normal standard childhood. She just didn't really feel like she fit in and so she went inward to her own world to help with that. But at the time of the trial, Juliet's father, Henry, had actually left with her brother and didn't even come to the trial to support her. Pauline's father couldn't handle going to the trial because it was about his wife's murder that had occurred because of his daughter, and this was something that put him in a very strange position. But on August 28th, both Pauline and Juliet were found guilty. They were not found to be insane, but because they were both minors, they were too young for the death penalty, which was actually still hanging during this time, and so they only got five years each instead. They were then sent to two different prisons to serve their sentences. Four months after this though, something called the Mazengarb Report came out and this was evidence of moral decline in adolescents or children. Now this case, the case of Honora Reaper or Parker being murdered by two teenage girls was used as evidence of this because this was report on moral delinquency in children and adolescents. A seven member committee came up with this whole report because they were saying that teenagers were getting out of hand and that the crime done by teenagers was increasing. The prime minister at the time named Sid Holland actually came forward saying that this was a national problem and needed investigating immediately. So that is what they did. This report was sent to every New Zealand home saying that there was an adequate parental supervision and excessive wages given to teens as well as the amount of American films and literature that were to blame for this increase in crime. Parents were asked to give their teens a return to Christianity and a quality of family life and also censorship on sex advice to the youth. They also said that there was a decline in state care, so like a foster care system over there, and so they believed that because these children were in their homes that the parents were to blame for all of this. However, after this came out and this set a panic in for all parents who believed they were now at fault for all of this, things, you know, of course changed, but the level of moral decline still increased after this. And it was found in 2020, just last year, that there are now more children in state care than ever before, but there was also at least 250 thousand children who had suffered abuse in the care of that system. It was said that many of these children were taken from their houses due to poverty and they ended up enduring more trauma in the care system than they ever would have at home and they ended up going back home traumatized. But Juliet and Pauline were in jail for these five years. Juliet claimed that they were never in a sexual relationship. They were never lesbians. They were simply just friends. And there is also a story of Pauline being found to have been with one of her family's boarders because they, of course, got boarders to their home. He was a male boarder and she was found in his bedroom, so he was kicked out. And so this was said to make it so she wasn't a lesbian, there is bisexuality, that is a thing. But either way, I would say, I would want to say that their sexual preferences had nothing to do with this murder, but I'm not sure that's the case. The reason I say that is because whether these two girls loved each other or not, the prejudices against the LGBTQ plus community and the fact that this was believed to be a mental illness caused these parents to force their children to separate because they believed they loved each other as more than friends. Now, I'm not saying this is an excuse to murder, and it's definitely not Anora's fault that she was trying to keep her daughter away. In these times, unfortunately, that wasn't normal, 
but I'm just saying it's something to note that it did play a part in this case. I'll just leave it at that. I think it can be a very tricky case because you definitely don't want to say that, oh, that makes it okay because they were being separated because they loved each other. So it was okay that they murdered because it's not okay that they murdered, but you can also see how that plays a role in this case unfortunately. Now, while in prison, Juliet refused to have visitors, but she did write to her father. She also sent him shirts she would make because that was part of her job in the prison, was to make clothes. And so that's what she learned and she would send it to him. And she also worked on her school and even worked on the inside really hard. She had big dreams, but her father claimed that she was still someone who had her head in the clouds and that she wanted to be this big famous novelist. And he basically told her that wasn't gonna happen. The prison psychiatrist did say that they strongly believed she did suffer from mental illness. Pauline, on the other hand, she believed that she was already famous due to the trial that gave her a lot of attention. She graduated high school while inside of prison. She started to study university, but she also would act better than all of the other inmates and try to get things out of the guards because of what she believed to be her fame. However, all in all, she was a good prisoner and she ended up being able to get out on parole on the weekends due to her good behavior if she went to her university classes. So on December 4th of 1959, just five years after the murders, both of these young girls who are now young adults, who were 22 and 21, were released. Some have said that they had to promise never to see each other again, but this is actually not something that was ever brought up upon their release. But it was said that the reason that they were released was because the board that released them said that they did not believe that either one of them would have killed on their own, that if they were together, that was the reason that they killed. So it doesn't really make sense to me that they would say, oh, well, just because they were together, they were killers, and then not make it a thing where they would have to be separated. But the big question was, where did they go after they were released? This was a long time ago. And what did they do in the time between they were released and the present? Well, that was the most interesting and mind-blowing part because Pauline changed her name to Hillary Nathan and went on to graduate from that college that she was going to. She then went on to become a nun, but this didn't last long and she was off of her probation by then. So she actually ended up moving to Kent in the UK to a very small little village. She's actually said to have no contact with the outside world. She doesn't talk about her past. She was said to teach special needs to children at a school. And then after she was retired, she started a school to help kids with writing. Her sister has been the one to talk to the press about Pauline and has said that she's now a Roman Catholic who prays often and doesn't watch the TV or listen to the radio and she doesn't get out much. Pauline's sister has said that the murder basically just got out of hand and that Pauline is very sorry about what she did, but it did fit, take her five years to realize and feel remorse for the murder. Pauline is said to now live in Scotland, but she still doesn't do interviews and she lives a very quiet life. Juliet, however, moved back to England and was said to become a Mormon. She changed her name to Anne Stewart and no one really knew where she went after that. She kind of just disappeared. This was of course concerning, but that is when a movie came out called Heavenly Creatures. This was in 1994, based on this murder case. And after this, the intrigue about the teenage killers, of course, heightened once again. That's when a journalist named Lynn Ferguson decided to look into where Juliet had gone. And that is when she came across a rumor that she had become a novelist, like she had always wanted to. So Lynn Ferguson decided to look into different birth dates of writers to see what she could find. And that's when she found a match. This matched to an author under the name of Anne Perry. She was the best-selling author of crime books. She had sold 20 million copies of her novels, and these novels were about murder, written by a teen convicted murderer. 
It turned out that Juliet had applied for a visa to go live in Los Angeles like she had always wanted, but she was denied due to her murder conviction. So instead, she became a flight attendant and she would often go visit Los Angeles. But one time, she decided that wasn't enough. And so she literally got off the flight that she was working to Los Angeles and disappeared into the streets and never returned back for work. It turned out she had become a nanny and had figured out a way to get a visa while she was there. Now, she did eventually move back to England due to, I believe, her father getting sick and her neighbor actually was a published author. And that is when Anne, or Juliet, had an end. She went on to publish her books that she would write by hand and then never reread, just went ahead and sent them in and started writing a new novel. She was dubbed the queen of the Victorian crime novel and has written over a hundred novels. Her first one was called The Cater Street Hangman. Juliet, or Anne, has been spoken to and has said the only reason she went along with the murder was because she feared Pauline would kill herself if she didn't help kill her mother. Juliet said she felt like she owed Pauline because Pauline would write her all the time while she was in the hospital and she said that that was like a lifeline for her and that she owed Pauline a lifeline then. Moral choices and also I think very seldom does any tragedy occur where only one person is to blame. Usually a lot of circumstances have combined and it's very much an idea that in my mind that it's not just one person, but we all contribute to things that happen for better or worse. And we are responsible for our own contribution. In your personal life, you've had to deal with that, of course. Yes, I have. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, when I was 13, I became quite seriously ill. Uh, when I was 15, I committed a crime as, as, as an accessory, I was involved. What was the specific crime? Um... I helped someone kill another person. Who, who, which person? Their mother. This was a friend of yours? Uh, yes. Was the mother awake, asleep? Was she... When oh, she was you, awake. You, what, you, just, you jumped on her or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this all happened very quickly? It was within a space of... We, my parents were separating. My father had lost his job. We were about to leave the country. And I felt I had no time to find a better solution. She told me that if I left, it would be, she would take her own life, and I believed her. And, and when you are that age, you're not allowed to speak. In court, you mean? Yes. So you cannot say anything about what you did or why you did it. Julia was asked how prison was for someone who was a child who was in with a whole bunch of other adults and she said it was really rough because all the toilets and everything were out in the open but she got used to it. She said that she basically coped by owning her behavior and not feeling sorry for what she did or where she got herself. She also said she made friends and listened to everyone's stories which is how she got some information for her books. Juliet has also said that she made peace with what she did. She admitted she was wrong and she's sorry but she moved on. She said, you're not serving any purpose if you beat yourself up for the rest of your life. Oh, what was me is a pain in the everything, not only to yourself, but to everybody around you. The best you can do from then on is be the best person you know how and make damn sure you forgive everybody else. That means forgetting and not carrying grudges, which is not so easy to do, but you learn. If you believe in forgiveness, then that has to extend to everybody. She also claimed that she was on medication at the time of the murder for about nine months for tuberculosis, which this medication, she said, was later found to warp judgment. It was taken off the market because of this. However, the psychologist at the trial had gone over her medication and said that nothing she was taking would alter her personality. After it came out that she was this best-selling author and that everybody had been reading the crime books of a killer, she continued to publish books after she did some interviews and the number of books being sold actually increased significantly because many people believed who would tell a murder story better than a murderer herself. She said, I thought this was the end. I'll lose everything. I'll lose my career. It'll probably kill my mother. I'll lose my home and I shall probably end up living in a hut on the hillside. And I haven't lost anything, nothing at all. Not even a friend, grace of God there. Now, as of 2017, Juliet, or Anne Perry, 
moved from Scotland to Los Angeles permanently to work on turning her books into movies or movies for television, but she has released a book as recently as November 2020, and I think she has one releasing this year. But it is believed that Pauline and Juliet have not spoken since their trials and have not seen each other since. Do you believe these two girls were just as guilty? Who was the mastermind? Or were they in this shared psychosis where they wouldn't have killed without one another and they believed that this was the only option for them? Do you also believe that they were in love with each other? Do you believe that that played a bigger part in the murder than anything else? You guys know that I absolutely adore writing and so to hear that this crime writer who was so successful, like seriously, incredibly successful, something that every writer dreams of. And she had been a child killer who was then writing about murders. That is so disturbing. And the fact that she only got more famous after this blows my mind and just shows you how warped this society really is, you know? Like the fact that everyone was intrigued by the fact that she was a killer and not repulsed but I get it. We all listen to these crime stories. We all are obsessed with hearing more about it. It's just kind of disturbing to hear. And you know, a lot of the times when killers write books, the money does go to the family of the victim. However, in this case, that is not what happened at all. And Perry or Juliet is rich. She's gotten all that money. If you don't know, I actually have a second channel called Genuine Gems where I am vlogging my whole moving process. That will be linked in the description if you want to go subscribe over there. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.